Hi, we are Craig and Janice, and on this channel, we want to show you the world. Well, eventually. You see, we love to travel, and our plan is to sell everything, buy a catamaran, and sail around the world. And we want to take you along with us. Now, the catamaran we eventually live on will probably not be as nice as the one I sailed across the Atlantic last season. But that plan is probably a few years down the road. So in the meantime, we're going to sail our existing sailboat, a 35-foot Beneteau, around the breathtaking Thousand Islands, which is actually right in our own backyard. You'd be amazed, no matter where you are in the world, the beauty you can probably find if you just go out and explore what's right around you. Have a boat on any of the Great Lakes? Well, then you can make it to where we are in the Thousand Islands, and we'd love to meet you. Live on the other side of the world? No problem. Just sit back, relax, and we'll show you the Thousand Islands in all its beauty. So, let's go cruising. In the last episode, you saw that we sailed from Kingston, Ontario, Canada, which is our home base, to Clayton, New York. We checked out the town and we had an interesting conversation with the owner of Bella's who talked about how last year's record flooding really affected business. You see, Bella's restaurant is a waterfront restaurant, which makes it great for views, but kind of sucks when you have record high flooding because their kitchen, which is in the basement, was underwater. See, in a stroke of business genius, Melissa, the owner, and her husband decided to go out and get a shipping container and they made a makeshift kitchen in that and put it beside the restaurant and kept the doors open, which allowed customers like us to continue to have great views like this of the water while we ate dinner, completely unaware of the hardship that was going on beside the building. And that's where this episode will take over. See, the next day we went to the one thing that everybody says you have to see if you come to Clayton and that's the Antique Boat Museum. And let me just confirm that if you're in Clayton, it's well worth the trip. Not only you see wooden boats of all shapes and sizes that are quite beautiful, but we even got to take a ride in one, which was a hell of a lot of fun. So all that is coming up in this episode of Cruising Off Duty. So our, our Sunday morning has started. He's yeah. already done a drone of the town. Yeah, it's nice. And uh, we're walking to the Antique Boat Museum. We're walking past Bella's and their baking the is going. And it smells so good. I'm trying to stay away from it. Yeah. There's a little coffee shop up the, the sidewalk that I wanted to try because I've never been. I'm going to get a coffee Very there. Very picturesque. So we'll see what yeah, it's, it's like. Yeah, it's cute. The coffee corner. Here I go to get my coffee. So cute. So disregard, I went in there, it's super cute, but it's more of a sit down breakfast place than a, than a coffee shop to get a coffee to go. They only had the mugs. Yeah. Back to Bella's. Back to Bella's. <laughs> I'm in Bella's now for my coffee to go. So they got some selections. I'll probably go with hazelnut. And then we're gonna walk to the museum from here. Good morning. Good morning again. We are here in front of the Antique Boat Museum, about to get a tour by, uh, I guess, the lady in charge. So, Special backstage access again. Yeah, hopefully get a little bit of uh, insight into the different boats, how they got here, their story behind them and stuff like that. And we've been here once before, but of course we didn't have that kind of tour, so we're gonna hopefully learn more this time. It was really, really good last time mm -hmm. anyway. It even was very nice. The, yeah. For the second visit. So we're, we're coming back to see what we see. The crown jewel of the Antique Boat Museum is this massive houseboat that was built by George Bolt to oversee the construction of his castle. We had a very knowledgeable guide named Bobby that's going to tell you a little bit more. It is today, 106 feet, 9 inches in length, 307 tons in weight. Altogether today is a steel hole boat, though in its original state, La Duchesse did have a mahogany hole, and I'll touch on in a few moments as to why that changes. Uh, but you guys have been to Bolt Castles. You are familiar with the Bolt family history. You know, George Bolt worked his way up from nothing, become a very successful, wealthy businessman. He had a naval architectural firm in New York City designed and construct La Duchesse to be placed across from the uh, castle construction at the Yacht House so he could supervise the ongoings. Initially, he had intended to bring La Duchesse up through the Erie Canal. I don't know how much you guys know about the canal or the nursery rhyme low bridge, but they're very low-lying bridge in the canal, La Duchesse being a tall vessel. They realized pretty quickly upon completion that it was not going to fit. So George Bolt had them disassemble La Duchesse into three separate pieces, which were brought up here to Clayton by train, shuttled out to Wellesley Island, reassembled, and in 1903, George Bolt was able to live on La Duchesse while he supervised the castle construction. Uh, as you guys may remember, in 1904, George Bolt's wife, Louise, who he was constructing the castle for, passes away. Uh, so at that time, he discontinues all operations on the castle and no longer has a purpose for La Duchesse. So his daughter, Clover, alongside her husband, assumed control of it. He used it as a rental property for other elite families from New York and Philadelphia vacationing up at that time. They do that for a handful of years. However, shortly after George Bolt himself passes away, Clover decides to sell the entirety of the Bolt estate in the Thousand Islands with the exception of her own home up here, Hopewell Hall, to a man named E.J. Noble from Governor of New York, not far from us. Uh, E.J. Noble made his fortune from a type of candy, ironically related to boats. 
Uh, he became famous for the Lifesaver candy. Mm. Um, with that, he was able to amass enough of a fortune to purchase the entirety of the Bolt estate. He used La Duchesse essentially as a floating uh, hotel. In the 1930s, one could rent all of La Duchesse fully manned and operated at $100 a week. Unfortunately though for him, during the Great Depression, he did lose a lot of his money, though not all of it. The money he was able to hold on to, he didn't want to sink into La Duchesse. Uh, it being a mahogany hole boat at that time did require a very high degree of maintenance, so not paying the upkeep on the hole began to wear thin. As it happened, a floor joist disconnected from the hole, piercing it, and La Duchesse actually sank up to the top of the first floor in some sections for 12 weeks outside the Bolt Yacht House in 1943. Uh, during those 12 weeks, while La Duchesse was partially underwater, E.J. Noble at a dinner party had proposed to sell La Duchesse to a man named Andrew McNally III of Rand McNally Publishing, which you would be familiar with, the Matt Publishers. Uh, the story goes that initially E.J. had proposed to sell it for a dollar, though the final bill of sale, which we have in our records here, came out to a hundred, probably Andrew McNally feeling bad for the guy. He had refloated, took it across the river to Kingston, Ontario, to the dry and dredge docks there where they patched the mahogany hole as a short-term solution due to the fact that it was 1943, World War II still going on, still not accessible to the average person as it's all going towards a war effort. Uh, so because of that, the McNally's take La Duchesse back to the dry and dredge docks in the 50s, uh, steel at fair market value. They have Hutchinson Boat Works out in Alexandria Bay, designed and construct the steel hull, adding 60 tons in weight to La Duchesse and requiring at that time to be identified as a new vessel based on a new tonnage and a new hull. Uh, while it's there in the 50s, the McNally's also have a contractor go out to redo much of the interior. So while we're on board, I'll point out a lot of those changes that were made, why the McNally's chose certain changes as opposed to others, as well as bolt originals you can still see on board today from 1903. Uh, this area here that we are about to enter is the cruise quarters. This area suffered pretty extensive water damage and therefore did all have to be remodeled. But you'll see this isn't where the McNally's wanted to spend all their money remodeling, so it's a pretty basic design. White walls, linoleum flooring, kitchen straight out of the 50s, super simple. In this section is a crew dining room, two crew bedrooms, a crew bathroom, a kitchen, and a butler's pantry. Uh, so we'll head on so you guys can check out the cruise quarters. We'll uh, reconvene in the family dining room, which is the big red room. All right, I'll take it from here to expedite things, but thanks, Bobby. You were an excellent guide. We learned a lot. Due to this portion of the boat being underwater, the McNally's had to renovate this entire kitchen and they renovated it to standard in 1950s and that's the way it stayed. Who remembers the old bread boxes? Well, if you haven't seen one, that's what one looks like. This is the crew bathroom or head as they call it. It's really not so bad considering they're crew, except somebody needs to learn how to clean a sink. The crew cabins were also kind of cute. I mean, bright and airy. I've seen worse for crew quarters. And they have a cute little dining area for themselves. Now this would have been the formal dining room and back in the day this would have been all mahogany and quite breathtaking as the second floor still is. That fireplace is the original fireplace but everything else in here has probably been replaced with a cheaper wood such as pine. Here is a picture of what the original dining room would have looked like back when Bolt owned it. Down in this section there's a bathroom, two bedrooms and two uh, Jack and Jill suites. Really neat detail worth checking out down in here are all the doorknobs. They were all custom cast for the Bolt family to have the Bolt family seal in them. So they all had that letter B with the heart and the stag on top. Now these guest cabins are a little larger and a little more lavish than the crew cabins, but not outlandishly lavish. Just as a point of interest, all the wood you see is mahogany at this section of the boat, but because of the water damage, the McNally's chose to bleach them so they're lighter than they should be. When we get to the second floor, you're gonna see the mahogany in its dark, rich, original state. Uh, so we're going to head upstairs in a moment. A couple of things before we do. First, you'll notice the difference in the color of the mahogany. Much darker in this section as well as everywhere else upstairs because it did not suffer water damage and therefore did not need to be bleached. So everything upstairs is in its original state with the exception of remodeling, which I'll point out. Uh, so this room here, as it is today, clearly the master bedroom. Though in its original state, this whole master suite was set up very differently. Uh, as you guys were coming down that hallway, that room that is today the study, Originally, that would have been George Bolt's bedroom, and there was a private bathroom off of that as well. Um, not what the McNally's wanted, so they rearranged up here, but there was originally a door here, which led into this room, which was a den. There was a wall here, and that was a smoking room. So this was essentially a private living mm -hmm. space for George Bolt more than anything else. The McNally's wanted that larger bedroom, had the wall removed, though taking the care when removing that wall to preserve the original canvas ceilings in each room. Each room having its own golden leaf stencil work, you can see the difference between what was the den and what was the smoking room still preserved in those camps. The door that was here, they removed and bumped this wall outwards to make space for more closets. And overall, designed this room to look like a Pullman train car. 
all the blue shades throughout La Richesse actually being from the Pullman company themselves. Hmm. Uh, as we head down the hallway in a moment, be sure to poke your head in that study. You'll see on the desk a black and white photograph of the McNally family taken around the same time that they purchased La Duchesse. And you will see that they were a very young family at that time, so really quite the undertaking to try to revitalize La Duchesse being half sunken. Also in that room, you'll see a pair of white pants painted with some nautical themes. They are an actual pair of painted pants, which Andrew McNally would wear, speaking to his characteristics. He's a pretty eccentric and flamboyant guy, but a very fun guy, a patron of the arts as well. Uh, pictured on um, those pants are three of the McNally family boats. The bottom is La Duchesse itself. In the middle uh, is their speedboat called Knight Rider, and at the top is their mahogany boat called Kantiki. Also, as you're going down that hallway, be sure to poke your head in that bathroom. Uh, you'll see that green and white rubber tiling on the floor. That is what would have originally been downstairs in the cruise quarters. McNally chose not to replace it solely due to the fact that the linoleum was much cheaper um, and much more readily available at the time. Uh, so La Duchesse in around 1903 dollars cost $175,000, which in a dollar to dollar inflation today is about $4.5 million, uh, which I would even really say is a very accurate estimate for it. Uh, that's just the dollar to dollar inflation. That's not sourcing of like the Honduran mahogany that's all throughout the house bow. Uh, the labor, the hand carving, all of those things, all those details which are much more Hard, expensive hard, and hard, hard to, to even find today, yeah. yeah. You're trying to but build it exactly the way it was. Exactly, it yeah. It cost you a fortune, yeah. Right, if even legal to import this much. Mahogany, yeah. yeah, yeah. This was the salon pretty much in its original state from 1903. All the mahogany is in pristine, original shape. And that piano is a Steinway that George Bolt had commissioned for the boat. When the McNallys took possession of La Duchess, it wasn't there, so they thought it was lost or water damaged. Someone poking around the old boathouse found a piano and it was confirmed that that is actually the Steinway that was commissioned, so it was restored and put back on the boat. That piano is set there on purpose because those windows open up to the dance floor on the other side. Here's a picture of how it looked back in 1903 when George Bolt had it. No expense was spared as this skylight is actually made of Tiffany glass. That's the same glass that he used in his castle and also most of the hotels that he ran. This kind of doubled as the front porch of the boat and also the dance floor. As I mentioned earlier, on the other side of those glass windows is the piano where a professional piano player would be paid to play for all the high society guests that would attend. Bobby is just explaining to us that the McNally family did not have a boathouse like Bolt did to store this out of the elements. So they had to put on all the awnings and the screens to protect the wood floors from the rain and the wind. And by and large, their efforts to protect the wood worked out because this is the original floor, which is pretty impressive. Well, this pretty much ends our tour on La Duchess, except for Janice, of course, has to poke her camera into one of the living inhabitants of the boat. <laughs> she didn't like me either. <laughs> I didn't mean to scare the crap out of her, but I'm a big meanie. I'm going to get complaints from animal rights folks for that. <laughs> <She's> not happy. <laughs> it was very intrusive. That was mean of me. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I tell, yeah, when you went to get your thing, this bird with a giant branch flew over. I'm like, what the hell? So I had to like, excuse me, I'm filming this guy. And <laughs> I'm not filming you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she comes back every year. Um, it's a little intimidating sometimes when you're trying to dock your boat over there. She's uh, squawking at you, but uh, it's yeah, cool. it's always there. Now it was time to see all the rest of the antique boats at the Antique Boat Museum. Starting off with a building called Need for Speed. It's all about antique race boats. And then in another building that had the more normal cruising power boats. So the National Motor Boat Show, this exhibition is set up to mimic that of the original motorboat shows that took place in the early 1900s down near New York City. 
and the, of course, you know, the various manufacturers would go and display their new wares. And so this uh, represents a similar show, if you will. The Garwoods are represented here with this little speedster, and then this unique um, cabin cruiser, which is uh, a very rare Garwood, as I'm told. The assembled Lincolnu. I want a Lincolnu. For there. <laughs> the dark hair. Yeah, the dark hair. Yeah, the dark hair. I have the old fashioned bangs. And I even cut them short, super short sometimes, but he doesn't like that. He doesn't like the super short bangs. Oh, it's fun. are the illustrations that are mm. shown in this gallery. So they are illustrations that Theodore Geisel, um, or better known as Dr. Seuss, had <laughs> um, illustrated when he worked for the oh. Esso company. Illustrations were done by the artists prior to becoming known as Dr. Zeus. Where we have the St. Lawrence, and oh. we have Canada and the so U.S. So. Welcome to the Antique Boat Museum. I'll be your captain, Captain Bruce. Uh, 1920s, 1930s style uh, design. I tell you, that's a great seat. I'm not kidding. It is fun. Should I? You want? He's in the front and I'm in the very back. We're supposed to be the most exciting and the noisiest. Prohibition when um, li certain liquid substances were being brought in by the barrel or case or whatever from Canada or wherever they originated from. Uh, when they were running at night, the local people, of course, know the waters quite well and they know about this break, but the uh, feds, the, rev the, the revenueers, are not as familiar with the water. And of course, there's no street lights out here and you haven't got any, headlamp any headlamps. So 
they would come running across Eel Bay, which has some treasure shoals in a couple of places as you under it, and all of a sudden they disappear. The spotlights would go out trying to search the shoreline, they couldn't find them. And of course they'd stunk right through this narrows where we are now. It's gonna get a little wet. And not from me. Not because of my driving either. It's starting to rain now. It's all good. Where you see the sign, Thousand Island Park, if you, that's the pavilion. If you look behind it, there's an open field area. And you can see there's a couple of soccer nets on that open field. It wasn't always an open field. It used to be a very large hotel called the Columbian Hotel was there for several decades it and its predecessor but uh, in the 1880s 1890s 1900s it was a very popular very successful uh, hotel 1912 it burned a lot of things around here burned a lot, yeah, a lot, <laughs> everything. it was a big hotel solid wood burned fire I guess happened I believe in the kitchen or in the back somewhere in the pantries the, and the wind was blowing, unlike today, it was blowing from behind us that way toward the bridge. Huge fire, embers spewing into the air, and the, the embers went all, all this way to the hundreds of cottages that are on this side, downwind of the, of the fire. Many of the homes, I mean, probably hundreds, caught on fire. Some burned to the ground, most, some were destroyed totally, some were destroyed partially. Right next to there, on the end, there's a white and green house right on the corner yeah that is metal sheathed metal clad with a metal roof and it was the closest to the hotel fire but because it was metal it survived the fire and right next door to it is a off-white tannish house with a with two balconies first floor and second floor on the front you see that right next to the green and white one yes. that's the house next door the house next door is the house that survived the fire because it was the house next door to the metal clad house so everybody knows where the house next door is, T.I. Park. Where do you live? Oh, well, three houses down from the house next door. Oh, that's hilarious. Everybody knows oh where it is. This is a, a motor up post office. It's really volunteer. It's just been here for so long that uh, technically it, it's, it's, it's manned by volunteers. And they pick it up for you, bring it to the field. They pick it up over at Clayton, they bring it over, and then they, they distribute it. To, you see little, there's little cubbies in there. You may be able to see them on the back wall. And, uh, the old biblical style of post office. Where the tennis court is, from there on back, used to be uh, the, the Hotel Frontenac. The hotel Frontenac was a huge hotel. Let me guess, it burned down. And it burned down. That one burned in 1911. So that burned in 1911, which was a huge hotel. And then the Columbian burned in 1912, which is another huge hotel. And the two, that just kind of devastated the tourist uh, area. Uh, in the area, and then uh, income tax, IRS codes came along shortly yeah. thereafter, and then World War One came along, and things just started. And then, decade after that, the depression. So they never rebuilt. Yeah. They never rebuilt. They never came back then. But today, the islands are prospering. It's a great tourist place. It's a great place to vacation. Of summer homes. Some of these massive estate houses, though, I think it was because it was pre-land uh, pre, taxes. Yeah, pre and pre-income tax. So pre they could build tax. as big as they wanted and, and pre-income tax. Pre-income tax. So they could yeah. build as big as they want and never had to pay the government extra for a big house versus a smaller house. Yes. Now nobody would build a castle that big because they pay so much in taxes. They're going to be paying. They'll be paying. These structures here were built by the hotel for the hotel. Uh, so when you came to the hotel front neck, you could stay in a room or rooms or like a suite or you could rent a cottage. Stay for a week, stay for a month, stay for the season. And the way you got here was by railroad train. So back in the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s, there were no cars, there were no, no real highway, no highways, no cars really, to travel great in large quantities, no airplanes. So the way you traveled was by train. And the trains would come into Clayton, where the new hotel is today. And you come right up to the shoreline, get off your, maybe your, even your own private car, a Pullman car, walk 50 feet over to the edge of the dock, get on a steamer that was waiting for you. And the steamer would take you from the dock at the a train station to any of the, your destination in the island. You could go to the Hotel Frontenac, 
or you could go over to the Columbian, or you could go over to Murray Island, you could go down Alexandria Bay, you could go anywhere you wanted. There were so many choices then. And there were many trains that came in. Some days there'd be upwards of nine passenger trains arriving a day. Wow. This it was, was that place. popular. It, this was the place. It was hopping here. They had a, and now a, there's not one single hotel on an island anymore, is there? There's no big hotels anymore? No big hotels. Even while the island is our biggest and it has a small, very nice hotel. Uh, but no, there's nothing with hundreds of rooms. Kind of a thing. Not anymore. They're all on the mainland or you get your own boat. Yeah. And you have a floating cottage. But now there's a lot of really nice private homes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Beautiful private homes. That ends our day here at the Antique Boat Museum. The ride at the end was definitely the high point. It was a whole lot of fun. Clayton as a town is awesome and well worth stopping if you're a boater in the Thousand Islands. If you enjoyed that episode, show the channel some love and hit that like button. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel because we're going to continue to explore the Thousand Islands. If you want to know what we're up to in real time or you want to know where we're heading before we head there, definitely follow our Cruising Off Duty Facebook page. Hopefully we can meet some of you out on the water. And until next time, this is Craig signing off, wishing you safe cruising.